I just spent a week with my four and a half year old nephew, Teddy. Teddy, well into the captivating world of creative imagination, has the habit of rushing into a room, making sure he's got my attention, and then dropping the following on me with dramatic flair. Antsy, he'll say, I've got good news for you and bad news. With that, I know I'm in it. That Teddy has constructed an entire world of play for us. We're off to the moon, perhaps, in a rocket ship. That's the good news. But the bad news, our ship is out of gas. Together, we play in this balanced world of good news and bad news, pushing our imaginations to the limit. Teddy has learned, however, that his bad news offering often gets more of a reaction out of me than his good news. And as a result, has started to amend his statement. Actually, he'll say, I've got bad news and bad news. Not only are we out of gas, but the gas supply we brought along is the wrong kind. And we can't get more because all the refueling stations are closed, and our food supply is running out, and Teddy is great at spiraling out all the catastrophic possibilities in our shared story. I'm reminded of Teddy's bad news and bad news when I read closely the scripture Danita and Darren just shared. At first glance, the story seems to be good news. This is the famous covenant God makes with Abraham. Abraham, the father of faith, the person Christianity, Islam, and Judaism all trace back to as their shared ancestor. Here, Abraham has a problem, he has no heir, and God wants to fix it by giving him a son. Not only that, God promises to give land to Abraham's descendants, and to round it out, God is going to seal the deal by entering into a covenant. This covenant, a churchy term for bounded relational promise, is a big deal. Tradition in the ancient Near East, where Abraham was living, tells us that covenants, not too different from contracts, were often established between two parties, one with lots of power and one with very little power, through a ritual. The ritual usually involved the cutting in half and sacrifice of an animal, a physical embodiment and reminder of the oath taken by the less powerful, less powerful party, who would have to walk through the split halves of the animals, it would essentially be a ritual to say something like, should I break the promises I made here today, I too may be punished and cut in half. Yipes. This act was a reminder that the weaker party, the one with disproportionately less power, would be unequally responsible for any breach in the contract. Of all the pieces read this morning, this was only the part that seemed like questionable news, for it suggests that the full weight of the responsibility rests on Abraham's shoulders a heavy burden to bear. We have covenants in our faith world today. They are a way that we seek to be in bound relationship with God and with one another. At the church where I grew up, each time we welcomed in new members, we proclaimed a shared covenant. We do covenant with the Lord and with one another and do bind ourselves to walk together in the presence of God in all God's ways. It was a way to both continually remind ourselves and to say aloud to God that we are seeking deep relationship with one another and our creator. Here at Middle, similar sacred covenants are entered into with baptism. The person being baptized, their family, the entire congregation all say vows and make promises to be in relationship with one another and with God. Somehow the ritual of Abraham's day of cutting animals in half and walking through them of holding one party with less power accountable for any infractions has been altered. Today we see covenant as beautiful and necessary guidelines for our faith lives, mutual commitments of support and growth, rather than punitive and ominous contracts between powerful and the weak. Our text today tells us part of the story of that transformation, of how God reorients the terms of covenant to turn bad news into good news but we're not ready for that good news just yet. Because the unequal terms of the covenant aren't the only problem. No, just like in Teddy's favorite stories, we've got bad news and bad news on our hands. Indeed, this part of the biblical story adds empire to inequality. And in our text of covenant, we seem to have more covenant of empire than of God. Consider Abraham's first lament to God, that his house, his estate, his family name, and his wealth would be given to a slave. God's response is not to liberate the slave, 
or even to question the institution of slavery. Instead, he assures Abraham that he will have a child of his own. It seems like God is ignoring this glaringly bad news and that the systems of status quo, of oppression and injustice will stay in place. And what about that promise of a child? Only Abraham is present for the promise, but it will take Abraham and his wife, Sarah, to produce the long-awaited son, Isaac. Sarah isn't even mentioned here. She's nowhere in this text. Her role as mother and bearer of the promise is not just obscured, it is invisible. In the chapters of Genesis that follow, Abraham and his family get pulled into one of the messiest and most damaging family systems imaginable. Sarah, still unable to get pregnant, forces her female slave Hagar to produce a child for her husband, then treats Hagar terribly out of jealousy. Sarah then runs Hagar and her young son Ishmael out of their home when Sarah's son Isaac is finally born. After all that, we're left wondering who the promises of God are for. Just Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac? Just those with power? Just those who identify as chosen? And finally, the promise of land. God assures Abraham that his descendants will have land to possess, but we know that nearly a dozen other tribes are already living on the land that is promised. The triumphal conquest that unfolds later in our biblical narrative, where the Israelites enter into the land of milk and honey to take out and run out everybody already there, is essentially state-sanctioned genocide. The problems are problems of empire, of systems severely stacked against women, marginalized voices, and those without power. In this month of celebrating women's history, we need look no further than this very chancel and listen to the voice of Ruby Sales, our civil rights theologian in residence, to gain some insight. Ruby calls this the acceptance of slavery, the claims and fights over property, the silencing of women, a theological problem, a problem in the way we talk about God. She says the problem is a God with expansionism, God as a tribal God, the, the idea that God has a chosen people and that the project of genocide has God's own personal stamp, a problem where God is associated with the business of state and on the side of injustice. When we allow God to be aligned with those systems of empire, God becomes tr a tribal God and not a transcendent one. We need God to be a transcendent God, to be bigger and grander than the world we know. A transcendent God, though intimately caring for humanity and thus entering into human history, does not get mired down in the business of empire, does not get stuck in history. Transcendence means radically free. And with such freedom, God can be God with and for us while also going beyond us. Ruby, like Teddy, however, has more bad news. We all have at least a little of that empire in us. The universal appetite for empire, for power, for land, for inheritance is in us all. We're little Abrahams asking God to ensure us of our portion and our legacy, worrying how to ensure enough for us and not bothering to extend care to others. The problems of the text, the problems of empire, oppressive systems and modern day slavery, the erasure and silencing of women, genocide and manifest destiny are not gone. We've inherited these challenges and others in the ways that we have covenanted with empire. Church, we too have empire in us. We can spot it when we fall into the us and them terminology, when we allow our language to pave the way for the march of empire. Us and them is the language of empire. Empire is built on the backs of others. Its operative language is therefore that of us and them. We must be wary of repeating terms dictated by empire, even and especially when seeking to escape it. We can see it when we seek comfort, when we seek to comfort ourselves by believing that just because we go to a church that is open and affirming and we are led by a female black pastor, that we have left empire behind us. Because even in some of our best moments, such as recent discussions about racism and white fragility, we find ourselves still struggling to escape the empire building ideology of white supremacy as it seeps into and poisons our actions and words. But, but look back at this morning's text. For it also tells the story of how God's covenant seeks to escape empire ideology by replacing a transactional agreement 
with a transcendent relationship. Indeed, there is that strange piece of the ritual with the smoking pot and the flaming torch that may initially seem the most menacing, but is in fact the, place of the, the part of the text where we see God most active, most engaged. Instead of the traditional weaker party, Abraham the human, moving through the sacrificed animals, it is the smoking pot and the flaming torch that move through. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking pot and a flaming torch passed through these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Genesis tells us that God established the covenant and did so in a striking and quite frankly mystical way. God is the smoking pot and the flaming torch. Fire and smoke are some of the symbols God uses for herself in our biblical stories. Like when God is a pillar of fire leading the Exodus, liberating her people out of slavery, or a burning, burning bush, a flame but not consumed, calling out to Moses. Here, God is the one embodying the covenant ritual. God is lowering herself to take on covenantal responsibilities of being in relationship with humanity. This is a reorientation. God is taking on the consequences of human failure and covenant breaking. God is saying to Abraham and to us, I will hold it when you mess up, when you do not live into the fullness of the hopes and the promises I have for you. When you misinterpret, misrepresent, and misplace the plans I have for you, I will hold the light that illuminates the pathway back to righteousness. And we will mess up. Remember, we have internalized empire. God's reformulation of the covenant, however, instructs us in reorienting our spiritual and earthly relationships alongside a God who moves with us, for us, around us, and above us. This reformulation frees us to imagine wildly, to fail and do better next time. It allows us to imagine and enact the types of risks that will rewrite the story of empire as instead the reign of righteousness and the justice and justice on earth. God's action transforms how we can be in relationship with God. We are invited to be partners with her in addressing the power imbalances in the empired parts of our lives. She instructs us in decolonizing our minds and teaches us how to tread the territory of transcendence. In our text, God models for us a transcendent move over a transactional one, and she encourages us to do likewise. The symbol of fire itself, invoking as it does imagination, inspiration, a pathway to freedom that is an emblem of transcendence rather than empire. For what could burn, consume, and destroy, instead enlivens, emboldens, and liberates. It turns out I like Teddy's exhausting game of bad news. He forces me to imagine a world that looks different than the one I know. Together, we imagine solutions to problems that seem bigger than we are. And because it's imagination, our problem solving knows no bounds. Out of gas on the spaceship? We imagine a spaceship that doesn't run on gas. The Grinch, on top of stealing Christmas, has lassoed down the sun and we're plunged into darkness. Our imaginations allow us to create a world where everything glows in the dark. Middle, as your intern, I have this wonderful vantage point. I am both of the church and not, both an insider and an outsider. I get to see with fresh eyes things about this place that maybe you can't or have stopped seeing. I see your imaginations running wild with God's to address the imbalanced world around us, to transform with love, and to reframe and reclaim Christianity. I can see the ways that you are acting as a transcendent church. It's at work in the way that you've imagined new leadership when I can see young people, your young people, raised and loved in this community, now asked to teach and lead at our National Revolutionary Love Conference. You are entrusting Malaika as a teacher and leader, their voice amplified and honored to speak about how we can address the imbalanced imbalance around queer identity and experience. I see the dynamic intergenerational youth ministry reimagining a youth group model that allows our valued elders, like Alan and Geraldine, too often sidelined to be youth ministers and to simultaneously create spaces for sixth graders to show up and show off all that they know to their high school siblings in faith. I see a gospel choir that looks like a party in the reign of God set loose here on earth one radically inviting in all voices to sing and to dance, to tell the shared stories of our life together. 
And I see a congregation at work to expose and dethrone white fragility, practicing the skills to name racism in ourselves and in those we love, imagining into reality a world that looks more like that which God would have for us, one where tough work yields true and deep relationships, one that dismantles white supremacy. What other justice initiatives of, or relational opportunities elude us because, because we haven't imagined them yet? And what might we dream up together? What ways are we called to do as God has done and reorient ourselves and the systems in our city and our country for greater justice? Let's imagine and covenant with God and with one another and have it be so. Amen.